All right. So let's start out with a few acknowledgements. Uh, this says uh, work from uh, NERS from uh, Oak Ridge, and uh, I wanted to include some special thanks to Zahar and Roman from, from Intel. They have been extremely helpful in uh, uh, answering our questions and helping to, to, to uh, address our suggestions and, and work out any other issues that we've had with uh, Intel Advisor. So I'll start out with a brief introduction. Uh, so when we think about performance models and performance tools, why are we using them? Well, we want to identify any of the performance bottlenecks that we actually see in applications. We want to motivate some of these software optimizations to try to address those bottlenecks. But perhaps most importantly, we want to actually determine when we're done optimizing. That is, the performance model itself provides us with a goalpost that says, this is where you're done. This is at this point you're not going to get any kind of better uh, better performance from your code by doing continual software optimization. Uh, moreover, we can actually assess our, our application's performance relative to the actual machine capabilities, rather than simply saying we're 10% faster than we used to be. We can actually say we're within 90% of the machine peak. Once we actually get there, we can actually use the root line and that, that level of performance to actually motivate any algorithmic changes. That is, once we're at, at using the full capabilities of the machine, the only way we're going to get better performance on our application is to make fundamental algorithmic changes. Um, one of the other areas we use performance models is in a co-design effort. That is, we want to actually predict performance on future machines or future architectures. So we can actually use the performance models to set realistic expectations uh, uh, for future procurement. That is, we have a future proposed machine. We can actually get some estimate of what the uh, performance will be of various applications on that machine. Uh, similarly, we can actually use it to address what the actual bottlenecks are on uh, current machines to hope that future architectures address those bottlenecks in hardware. So uh, when we think about performance models and simulators, uh, historically, many of those performance models and simulators have tracked latencies to predict performance. That is, they try to count cycles. We can see this in, in cache simulators uh, uh, very clearly. Uh, but the last two decades saw a number of latency hiding techniques put forward by vendors. We have out-of-order execution. We have uh, where, where hardware tries to discover parallelism at runtime to hide latency, whether this is, is memory latency or instruction latency. We have hardware, uh, including hardware stream prefetchers, so that uh, when detecting a certain miss pattern, uh, the hardware can speculatively load data to try to hide the associated cache miss latency. And we have massive thread parallelism, where we can simply uh, quickly switch between threads in order to, to always have some useful work to actually execute and thus uh, satisfy the latency bandwidth product of the machine. And ultimately, this is uh, effectively that these latency hiding techniques has resulted in a shift from a latency limited computing regime to a throughput computing limited regime. That is, instead of being limited by, by latencies by nanoseconds here and there, we are limited by the underlying rate of which we can move data and, and perform computation. So the roofline model is, is a throughput oriented performance model. It's going to track rates, not time. Uh, it is augmented with Little's Law. Basically, the concurrency is, is the latency bandwidth product. And it is going to be independent of instruction set architecture, for the most part, and, and the underlying core architecture. So this allows it to be easily applied to CPUs, whether multi-core or mini-core, uh, to GPUs, and even to uh, Google sensor processing units. Uh, fundamentally, we have three main components in, in roofline-based performance modeling. We have machine characterization. This is going to set some realistic performance potential of the underlying system. We have monitoring. That is, we want to actually characterize an application's execution. And then in another aspect, we have application models. That is, uh, for the ideal architecture or the ideal compiler, how well can actually our kernel actually perform? And so that, that basically sets an upper bound to say, no matter what we do uh, for optimization, uh, no matter how well we can, we can improve the uh, architecture, uh, here is the ultimate performance bound that we can get for our application. So let's start out with a simplified version of, of the roof line. In this case, it's a DRAM roof line. Now, ideally, one might hope that we can always attain peak flaws, but in reality, we have finite locality. That is, we have finite reuse of data. 
So I reference a, a uh, array element in memory. I can perform so many plots on that, but that, not, that amount of reuse of that one array element uh, provides a bound on performance. So we can plot that bound using arithmetic intensity as the x-axis. So arithmetic intensity is the ratio of plots to bytes presented to, to DRAM. Uh, our performance bound, we can thus say, is, is not just simply peak flops, but also includes the actual bandwidth of the underlying machine. So depending on where we are in terms of arithmetic intensity, we can actually decide whether we're going to be compute bound or memory bound, ultimately. That is, uh, kernels with arithmetic intensity less than the machine balance are typically or are ultimately memory bound, while those that are uh, more compute intensive than the machine balance are ultimately compute bound. <clears throat> now we can go through and think about a few examples of how we actually apply this. Now, in practice, the typical machine balance, whether it's going to be a, a KNL or a multi-core processor or a GPU, is somewhere around five to ten flops per byte. That's kind of an un, that's kind of a fundamental aspect of, of current process technologies which basically says you're going to need to do 40 to 80 floating point operations per double uh, to actually com exploit the underlying compute capability of one of these processors. And ultimately, because this is a artifact of technology and money, it's unlikely to improve in the future. So let's consider stream triad. In this case, we're just going to do a simple vector-vector uh, 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 operation. Uh, assuming n is sufficiently large that it doesn't fit in cache, we're going to do two flops per iteration and we're going to transfer 24 bytes uh, per iteration. That is, we read x, we read y, and we write z. This gives us an arithmetic intensity of about 0.166 uh, flops per byte, which puts us heavily on the memory bound regime. Now, let's think about another example where we actually increase arithmetic intensity. So in this case, we have a very simple canonical seven-point constant coefficient stencil in three dimensions. Uh, we're going to do three flops per, per iteration, and for each of those iterations, we're going to do eight memory references. This includes seven reads, a store, uh, and uh, ideally, the cache can filter all but one of those reads or writes per point. That is, with sufficient capa uh, cache capacity, we can eliminate all but the cache compulsory misses. As a result, we have an arithmetic intensity of about 0.43 flops per byte, which, although it's still memory bound, the roofline model allows us to, to uh, show that we will get higher performance, a higher flop rate for that underlying code. Now, we can extend the roofline model to actually include uh, multiple levels of the cache hierarchy. So any real processor is going to have many levels of memory. We can start with registers. We have L1, L2, L3, however many levels of cache. We can have an a, a MC DRAM or HP, uh, HBM on the package. This is something like uh, the KNL memory or the GPU's device memory. Uh, we then have DDR main memory. And in the case of some newer systems, we may actually have NVRAM in the memory space. So we can actually measure a bandwidth for each of those levels of the memory hierarchy and actually define an AI for each uh, kernel, uh, for each level of the memory hierarchy. So in this case, we may see that uh, our given kernel has two arithmetic intensities associated with it. It has an AI, a flop to DDR uh, arithmetic intensity, and it has a flop to, D, uh, to MC DRAM uh, arithmetic intensity. And we can see, based on the performance models and the relative bandwidth of the uh, underlying architecture, that the DDR bandwidth, in this case, and the DDR arithmetic intensity is the ultimate bottleneck to performance. Now, we could imagine a different kernel, in which case we have much higher uh, DDR arithmetic intensity. That is, we can imagine we fit the, the uh, problem in MCD RAM and thus get substantial reuse, and as a result, uh, the amount of data that we actually have to move to DDR is dramatically diminished. In this case, we can actually improve DDR arithmetic intensity, and now, uh, as a result, MCD RAM is our ultimate bottleneck to performance. Now, this basically says that we need to know the uh, arithmetic intensity and the relative bandwidth for each level of uh, cache in order to actually bound uh, the ultimate performance potential for any of our applications or underlying kernels. Now, we can similarly augment the roofline model with uh, data instruction or thread level parallelism. That is, we have nominally assumed that we can always attain peak flops if we have an infinite locality, but the reality is that's not necessarily true. 
So a canonical example is, is that current architectures include a fuse multiply add instruction. That is, with one instruction, you can do a multiply add operation. Now the question happens, what happens if, if your code just does adds and it doesn't do any multiplies? Well, basically that, that uh, eliminates half of your performance potential. We can, by the same extension, think about what happens if we uh, don't exploit vectorization. That is, uh, on a machine like uh, uh, KNL, if you're in single precision, you might be able to do 16, uh, sorry, if you're in double precision doing FMAs, you might be able to do 16 floating point operations per instruction. If we don't generate vector code but generate scalar code, we lose a potential factor of 8 or, or even 16 from our potential performance. Uh, there is also unrolling, that is, a floating point unit like memory has a certain lat latency associated with it, and we need sufficient parallelism to cover that latency. Uh, we also need, uh, we have parallelism in hardware, so we need multiple threads, uh, OpenMP threads, for example, CUDA uh, threads, and GPU, to actually provide sufficient parallelism across our compute resources. So we can, in the roofline model, add additional uh, what are called ceilings to, to our performance potential, which further bound uh, the actual potential performance. So a kernel, which might have been uh, memory limited in the ideal regime, may actually fall to being compute limited without vectorization. So at this point, um, I think I'm going to take a, a quick break and ask if there are any kind of questions to this point on roofline. Uh, yes, yeah, so actually, uh, so there is one slide where you have uh, 0.166, and I think there is a question where that number comes from. There, yes. Uh, hopefully, if, if I did this right, this is 2 divided by 24. Right, yes. And then in the uh, slide 11. So just to be clear, that was the two flops divided by the 24 bytes. Right. Sorry. Slide uh, 11 now. Uh, are these the same kernels? So then how do you get different uh, AI for, same kernel, for the same kernels for different memories? So it can be the same kernel. So we can imagine a, a case where we have a kernel which uh, has a active working set which might fit in uh, MCD RAM but has a, a total footprint which may actually uh, not fit in MCD RAM. So imagine the case where we have a working set which might be in total uh, 30 gigabytes. Uh, that means that as we, we process that data, we may not be able to fully contain it within the MCD RAM. But within that kernel, we have a di an additional level of locality of, say, 8 gigabytes. So we can turn, perhaps in this particular contrived example, on that 8 gigabytes 20 or 30 times before we have to move to the next 8 gigabytes in our 32 gigabyte total problem size. So this gives us a, a several tiers of locality where we can actually get the locality in MCD RAM, but actually still have a problem size that actually fits in, in uh, DDR. Uh, another question related to this, but the flop per byte doesn't change, does it? Well, you will have two flop per byte. So you will have a flop per byte associated with MCD RAM, and you will have a flop per byte associated with DDR. So in both cases, the bytes, the denominator is the number of bytes being moved to that level of memory. So there's a certain number of bytes that have to be moved from DDR. There's a certain number of bytes that have to be moved from MCD RAM. The underlying kernel will do the same number of flops, so the numerator remains the same, but the denominator can change. So another question here, Sam. Um, must the roof line model be run utilized on all cores on a node, or can it be used on one core? No. So you can certainly use it on, on one core. Um, if, if in the case you want to actually test what is the Omdahl effect of, of this machine, you could theoretically collect the, the roofline data for a single thread on, on a, a 60 core uh, KNL and actually determine how much lower your associated MCD RAM uh, and DDR bandwidths actually are. And that's a, a very useful uh, 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 set of numbers when actually deciding uh, when running hybrid code, how much of a penalty there is for not accelerating certain, uh, not threading certain loops. What's DLP in slide 12? Uh, DLP? Yeah. Uh, DLP is data level parallelism. So it's essentially a uh, vectorization or SIMD. And TLP is, is thread level parallelism. I think that's about it, so just easy. So at this point, let's uh, switch and show
how we actually use uh, or collect roofline data using the Empirical Roofline Toolkit, using VTune, and using SDE. So in our basic roofline modeling, there are two, uh, two main things that we actually have to start with. There is the machine characterization. This is the potentially underlying system. Uh, basically, it's questioning how does the system respond to a lack of FMA, DLP, TLP, whatever, uh, and how does the system respond to reduced arithmetic intensity? That is, as I lose uh, locality, how uh, pronounced are the memory and cache bandwidth effects? Uh, that could be extended in the future to include how does it respond to NUMA, strided, random access patterns, whatever. Um, but there's the corresponding aspect, which is how does, uh, how, uh, when I actually instrument my application, what are the properties of my application's execution? That is, when I sit down, what is the application's real arithmetic intensity as measured on the target machine? How does the uh, AI actually vary with memory level? That is, the L1 AI or the MCD RAM AI or the DDR AI. And similarly, how well does the app vectorize and whether, does, whether or not it uses fused multiply data? So the first question, how fast is my target machine? Well, there are a few challenges associated with this. It's not quite as uh, simple a question as, as, as it might seem on, on the surface. Uh, we have a large number of, of systems. Uh, we have new ones that come out every year. Uh, each of them is associated with a huge amount of documentation that one might need to, to assimilate in order to actually predict what the actual performance is. And unfortunately, the actual real performance numbers are often less than the kind of marketing numbers that are actually advertised for machines. Um, this is actually further complicated by the fact that compilers can actually give up on big loops. That is, imagine I, I've, I've reordered my loop nest, I've, I've uh, restructured my code to maximize uh, locality, and the result is a very uh, large, ugly inner kernel in my loop nest. Uh, some compilers can actually give up on that and thus see degraded performance. So what do we do? Well, so our approach at LBL was to create a, a benchmark, the Empirical Roofline Toolkit, to actually characterize CPU and GPU accelerated systems. So in the most basic sense, it will uh, measure the peak flop rates of those target machines. It will measure the bandwidth of each level of memory hierarchy, and it's written in a MPI plus uh, OpenMP slash CUDA version so that you can run on, on multiple sockets without incurring NUMA effects, or you could run on multiple GPUs on a single node in order to get the full potential of a multi-GPU node architecture. So we can actually run this on K&L. We see uh, a, a automatically generated roofline figure that tells us what the bandwidth are at each level of the, of the memory hierarchy, as well as the peak block rate that can actually be attained. And we can actually also run it on Summit Dev with uh, four GPUs. And we can see the relative performance differences of these two node architectures in the absence of any kind of theoretical performance number. This is the actual empirical performance that one can attain on these two machines. So on the second half of the question, which is, is uh, application in instrumentation, this can actually be an even more challenging problem. And this is challenged from several different aspects. First of all, flop counters uh, on, on CPU or GPU architectures can be broken. They can be missing. Uh, they can be disabled, like in the case of, of Haswell. And uh, similarly, simply counting loads and stores, that is the number of, of uh, bytes presented to the memory hierarchy as opposed to being filtered uh, by the memory hierarchy, is, is somewhat misleading because it doesn't really capture any of the reuse. Similarly, uh, uh, counting simply the, the number of L1 misses or the L2 misses is not a good proxy for data movement because it doesn't account for the fact that there is an autonomous hardware prefetcher there pulling in data before you actually miss. Uh, the, we have found that the DRAM counters are accurate, but the downside is, is they are privileged and thus nominally inaccessible to user mode. Uh, similarly, if you want to actually make certain counters uh, accessible, you may need certain OS or kernel changes, and those need to be approved by the vendor, for example, Cray, and then approved by the actual sensor, for example, NERSC, before they can actually be used by, by end users. So what do we do? So uh, NERSC and CRD, NERSC is, is the production computing facility at LBL, CRD is the computational research division at LBL, uh, collaborated on trying to figure out a methodology for actually uh, characterizing applications running on NERSC production systems. That is, we want to characterize a production system, we don't want to characterize just performance on a standalone system. 
So to that end, uh, we uh, use Intel SDE. This is a binary instrumentation tool to create software block counters. That way you don't have to worry if the block counter is actually broken in hardware or if it's poorly documented or if it just gives you erroneous data. In theory, one could use Bifel as well. Uh, we also used the Intel uh, VTune performance tool, uh, which was approved by NERSC and Cray and is actually enabled on the NERSC production machines to be able to actually access the uncore counters. So those two of the, the two of those gives us accurate plot numbers and it gives us accurate DRAM data movement on Haswell and KNL based machines. And there is an associated web page here. Uh, for those interested in seeing uh, all the details of actually how one uses these tools to actually measure uh, and instrument applications running on NERSC machines. So the NESAP project, this is NERSC uh, KNL application readiness project, uh, used RootBind to actually drive their optimization and analysis on KNL. That is, they wanted to actually uh, bound any performance expectations using the ERT relative to Haswell machines. Uh, we wanted to quantify DDR and MPD RAM data movement to actually understand uh, whether or not uh, KNL incurs more data movement than a traditional Haswell with a large shared uh, last level cache, uh, and actually understand the importance of vectorization. So we, we quantified some of those results in a few papers. They are uh, linked on my website uh, for those interested in and uh, uh, reading the details of those. So when we actually sit down and, and run those, in this case, uh, we're showing three of the NESAP codes, MFDN, which is uh, Nuclear Many Body Configuration Interaction, EMGO, which I believe is a, a sensor code, uh, and PIXAR, which is a particle and cell code used for accelerator modeling. We can plot the roof line for both a two processor Haswell node, this is kind of a Cori phase one or Trinity phase one type architectures or a KNL node architecture, kind of the, the Cori phase two type architecture. And then plot performance as a function of, of different application parameters or optimizations for each of those different machines. So for example, uh, we see that, that in general, the KNL does have higher peak bandwidth, but we observe that the actual arithmetic intensities can be lower. And as a result, performance uh, may not be as good. That is, you have higher bandwidth, but lower arithmetic intensity, those can be a wash against each other. Uh, moreover, the importance of vectorization can be actually very profound on, on KNL and lead to uh, substantial uh, speed ups uh, relative to original or scalar codes. Now, we can use uh, VTune and SDE to, to collect uh, this kind of application data. But ultimately, we're having to compose several tools together. That is, we get a little bit of information out of SDE, we get some uh, Uncore data movement out of VTune, we have to throw those together into a, a graphing tool and, and hope that everything comes out and is easily visualized. Uh, but unfortunately, that's a pretty high burden to place on, on application developers or, or even uh, uh, highly motivated uh, users. That is, we're forcing them to, to learn uh, and run multiple tools. Uh, we're forcing them to manually instrument every routine in their application, or at least the routines of interest. And we're forcing them to manually parse, compose, graph the output. Uh, and moreover, this still lacks any kind of integration with a compiler, uh, debugger, disassembly. So if you want to actually understand why your code is slow, then you still need to look at the compiler disassembly and, and uh, uh, run it through a debugger. Uh, so ultimately, NERSC and, and uh, CRD wanted a more integrated solution. So um, at this point, I'm going to take a quick break uh, and see if anybody had uh, questions on the VTune SDE uh, slash ERT methodology. Well, the only question I see here is, uh, let's see, uh, okay, so there's one here on the slide 19. Uh, what cache model or models were used for the byte denominator for AI? Uh, just to be clear, it's this, this slide 19? Uh, it's slide 19. That's for the... Uh, uh, I may have answered. Oh, 18, sorry. <laughs> it does correct. Okay. Um, for 20. <laughs> I, I think I inserted one extra slide from whatever the yeah. slide got, that got sent out. Um, so um, if, it's, if it is this slide that, that's being referenced, the, the flop to byte ratio is the flop to MCDRAM ratio for each of these machines. 
Uh, sorry, it, it swaps the MCD RAM for KNL and it swaps the DDR for Haswell because Haswells don't have MCD RAM. There was one uh, earlier here. What does the green line in CD-ROM have for a Y offset for AI equal to zero? So I think this was in the previous oh, part. Um, so, so there, there is no, you can never actually have an, in the roof line figure, you can actually, the so roof line nominally plots a log-log uh, scale, and as a result, you never actually see the, the, the uh, zero intercepts. You could have an AI of zero by having no flops in your inner kernel, but just have bytes. Uh, but then you really shouldn't be using a flop to byte ratio. But when plotting, because it's on a log log scale, you'll never actually see a zero zero uh, intercept. The last one here, um, let's see here. What are software AI counters? So in, in hardware, theoretically, every time you do a multiply or a multiply add, in addition to the, the logic that goes into actually performing the arithmetic, there's another piece of, of logic which actually just simply counts how many times you've done that instruction or how many times you've done that operation. Now, because those can be broken and because they, they uh, are not a, a high priority for vendors, uh, software counters uh, is an alternative uh, method for actually counting the number of operations. So one can imagine taking uh, either at the compiler level or through binary instrumentation uh, source code, and then every time you have a, a multiply in your source code, you have a separate counter, a separate variable that simply counts how many times you've done a multiply or how many times you've done an add. So in software, you are simply counting in, in, uh, concurrently with the actual ex execution of your application the number of floating point operations. And some, um, there is an observation here that on KNL uh, there is no flop hardware counters. So how did you uh, get those flop counts? So SDE is the binary instrumentation tool. So we use the software flop counters used by uh, provided by SDE. Okay. So let, let yeah, move on for the next session, please. So at this point, I want to take a slight uh, diversion, uh, it's an important one, and discuss the difference between roof line and what the literature calls a cache-aware roof line. So there are two major roof line formulations in the literature. There is the original, uh, which is also called the DRAM, or it's also called the hierarchical roof line. This is in the original CACM paper, uh, Communications to the ATM. Uh, it defines multiple bandwidths that we talked about earlier. Uh, it defines multiple bandwidth ceilings uh, and, and multiple AIs for every kernel. Uh, the performance bound is going to be the minimum of the intercepts of, of each of these uh, AIs with their corresponding bandwidths and the, the associated flop rate. Now, there's also a cache aware roof line which appeared in, in uh, computer architecture letters uh, a few years ago. Now, in this case, it defines multiple bandwidth ceilings but uses a single arithmetic intensity, and that arithmetic intensity is the flop to L1 byte ratio. So as one loses cache locality in the cache aware version, that is, you have uh, capacity misses or conflict misses, performance falls from one bandwidth ceiling to the next at a constant AI. So why does this matter? Well, some tools use the original roof line, some users use the original roof line, uh, some use the cache aware, and it's important to know the differences so that when it's presented to you or when a tool that you're using uses one or the other, you know how to interpret the data. Now, perhaps more importantly and, and uh, uh, germane to this presentation, the Intel Advisor tool uh, nominally uses the cache aware roofline model, but there is an alpha slash experimental uh, version that actually uses the DRAM roofline that we're going to, to be evaluating. Now, generally, uh, I think uh, CRD and NERSC prefer the, the hierarchical roofline as it provides greater insights into the behavior in the memory hierarchy. So let's go through a, a quick example comparing the two. So uh, both roofline and cache aware capture cache effects. Uh, in roofline, the AI is the flop to byte ratio uh, for each level of the memory hierarchy after being filtered by all the lower levels of the cache hierarchy. Conversely, in the cache aware version, the AI is the uh, uh, the number of bytes is, is the number of bytes presented to the L1 cache. That is, it's basically an a, uh, L1 arithmetic intensity. 
Uh, in the traditional roofline, you have multiple arithmetic intensities, while in cash-aware, it's a single. And as a result, the AI in the traditional roofline is dependent on problem size. That is, as you scale up the problem size, you may incur capacity misses. Capacity misses increase the number of bytes moved uh, uh, to DRAM, which means your denominator, your AI denominator gets bigger and your AI overall gets smaller. Conversely, the cash aware version is independent of problem size. So we can directly observe uh, locality and cash effects in the traditional roofline model, but they are kind of indirectly observed in the cash aware version. Now, perhaps the biggest issue is that the traditional roofline requires performance counters to actually measure AI. That is, we really need to know how much data is actually being moved to DRAM, which in uh, nurse-based machines has meant access to the uncore uh, performance counters. Conversely, the cache-aware version uh, requires only static analysis or binary instrumentation to measure AI, and thus it's much, much easier to implement and doesn't require any kind of special permissions or uh, privilege levels to realize. So let's go through an example. So in this case, we're going to go back to our, our simple uh, stream triad example. Uh, once again, we're doing uh, uh, two flops uh, and, and 24 bytes. Uh, we have no uh, cache reuse, uh, and as a result, uh, uh, we end up with the same uh, DRAM AI uh, as the L1 AI for, for problems that don't fit in cache. So let's uh, think about how we plot these two. So if in the traditional roofline model we had a DRAM line and an L1 line, we can simply plot uh, the associated AI, in this case it's the same AI for DRAM and for L1, and show that the performance is actually ultimately bound by DRAM. Conversely, in the cache aware version, once again, we have always just a single AI, uh, and we can actually look at what our observed performance is and show that it is highly correlated with the DRAM bandwidth. So uh, at this point, we can think about moving to a slightly more complicated kernel. This is our seven point uh, stencil. Uh, we have seven flops, uh, eight doubles that we move. Uh, uh, in theory, at the L1 level, we have a AI of about 0.11, um, and this is assuming compilers don't do any kind of fancy register shuffling to, to reduce the number of loads. But in reality, we have some degree of cache reuse. That is, some of the references in our stencil are reused uh, from one iteration to the next. Uh, they are reused within the cache hierarchy, and as a result, uh, the DRAM AI tends to be larger than the L1 AI. Basically, DRAM moves. Uh, basically, we move less data to DRAM than we move uh, to and from the L1. But of course, bandwidths are different. So, if we were to plot this in the traditional version, uh, the uh, traditional root line will have two arithmetic intensities: one for L1 and one for DRAM. We can plot uh, the intercepts for the two, and in this case, we might say that. The actual performance is going to be the minimum of the two, and it is uh, bound to the DRAM bandwidth. Conversely, uh, for the cache aware version, we have a single AI based on the flop to byte ratio uh, presented to the L1. We have an observed performance that is somewhere between the L1 and the DRAM line. That is, in reality, if we just look horizontally across here, we're getting the same performance number in terms of flops. But in the cache aware roof line, we see a observed performance somewhere between L1 and DRAM bandwidths. Now, we can actually uh, infer that that says we've got some level of, of uh, cache locality, but not, uh, not full locality in the L1. Now, if we want go from a small problem to a larger problem, that is, we move from, say, a 256-cubed grid to a 512-cubed grid, what happens? Well. Going from small to large in the uh, traditional uh, roofline model means that we get the same L1 AI, but lower DRAM AI. Essentially, we're incurring capacity misses. Conversely, in the cache aware version, the AI remains the same, but the performance decreases, indicating we have lower uh, uh, reuse within the cache hierarchy, and thus we're, uh, on average, seeing memory bandwidth associated more with DRAM bandwidth for every memory reference. So um, 
I know those two concepts can be between the traditional roof line and the cashware roof line can be a little complicated, so I want to take a quick break here to see if there are any questions. I don't see any questions here. Oh, no, there is one here. Can you reiterate how the uh, 0 0.44 AI was obtained? Uh, so the 0 0.44 is, is more a, a uh, estimate in this case. Uh, I don't remember if it came from the empirical data based on on uh, if you were to actually run this on a machine, how well does the cache hierarchy filter out uh, all of the memory references that we present to it? So in this case, it basically is, is getting something like, uh, yeah, well, in the asymptotic limit where we have no capacity misses, uh, if we go back to the stencil code, uh, ideally we would have just uh, uh, filter out all but the reference to the right of new and the leading element of old, uh, which means 16 bytes and uh, seven flops. So I think you can take seven and divide by 16 and probably come pretty close to 0.44. So going back to slide 20, Sam, uh, the conclusion was that the, all the apps were uh, memory bound? Ultimately, they are bound by memory bandwidth. That is, uh, for the uh, arithmetic intensities that these NISEP codes have, they are ultimately bound by memory bandwidth. That doesn't say that the actual implementation at a given instant is completely bound by memory bandwidth. We observe on something like Pixar, that it is uh, still difficult to actually hit the memory bandwidth limit, and particularly difficult in the uh, original implementation without any kind of tiling or vectorization. So there is performance potential uh, on these codes, but ultimately uh, there's only so much we can gain uh, uh, through on-node optimization, because we can only make it as fast as, as DRAM without a fundamental algorithmic change. Another question here, how does the spatial locality affect, uh, affect AI? So if we are streaming through memory, then ideally we have high spatial locality. And by, and by spatial locality, we can, we can say you know, whether or not when we access uh, elements at, at uh, address I in memory, whether it's highly likely we will access elements at I plus one, I plus two, I plus three. Uh, so for streaming codes, uh, we, we have high spatial locality and thus we, we use all of the data that we stream through. But we can imagine in the case where we have a uh, array of structures uh, data layout where we may only access every fifth element or every eighth element. In that case, we have lost arithmetic intensity and this becomes a, a uh, well, we have, we have uh, we have lost arithmetic intensity because the number of bytes presented to DRAM is the number of, of, of cache lines, essentially, that we're having to access from DRAM. So if we're accessing every eight bytes of memory as presented to the memory hierarchy, the memory hierarchy will still move every byte uh, from memory because it will move data in full cache line granularities. And thus, the arithmetic intensity can, can suffer greatly. Thank you. Let's move on then. Uh, so, um, at this point, we're going to switch to a, uh, a demo of Intel Advisor. Uh, this is going to start out with just an introduction and general usage and huge caveat that the DRAM and uh, the DRAM roofline uh, part of Advisor and the OSX Advisor GUI are preview features and may not actually be included in the mainline product. Uh, uh, Intel is, is providing these features in order to collect uh, user feedback. So, uh, Intel Advisor is this? It's a very nice integrated uh, performance analysis tool. Uh, it provides uh, performance information, including uh, timings, flop, trip counts. It provides uh, tips for vectorization. It gives you memory footprint analysis, and perhaps most relevant at all to this talk, it uh, nominally uses the cache aware roof line model. Now, all of this information uh, from individual kernels, memory footprints, uh, vectorization tips, are all connected back to the original source code so that in a single environment, you get all of the information you want. So to that end, uh, CRD and NERSC began a nice, uh, a very effective collaboration with Intel. Uh, we wanted to ensure that Advisor actually runs on uh, Cori in user mode. Uh, we wanted to actually also push for a hierarchical roof line. That is, we wanted to see the effects of, of the cache hierarchy on arithmetic intensity. 
And we also wanted to make it uh, uh, functional, scalable to in the case where we have many MPI processes across either a single node or across multiple nodes. And then finally, we wanted to validate the results on various NESAP, SIDAC, and, and ECP codes. Um, I've included a few useful links to provide uh, background on Advisor. There's also another demo of Advisor uh, on, on uh, YouTube. And there is a NERSC webpage on how to actually uh, use Advisor on the NERSC systems. So I'm going to switch at this point and have Tomas uh, give the demo. So can you uh, share okay, so let's, Yeah, let's switch to my screen really quickly. Um, There we go. So I'm just going to show the same same slide. So here are instructions on how to run Intel Advisor on NERSC to to instrument an application. So compiling is is easy. There is not much extra needed. You only need to include the minus G for debug flags, and then. Uh, you either start an interactive session with the salloc command or submit to the batch queue by, by writing a, a batch script. Um, the, this, you don't need anything different if you're using the, the product uh, 2017 advisor version that we recommend for users. Uh, there, there are extra, you need to add, basically give extra permissions to the Anchor counters for the DRAM roof line that we're, I'm going to show briefly at the end. Um, but that, like Sam said previously, is still an experimental version. Uh, to collect the data, uh, there is an advisor module that you need to load that links you to the advisor binaries. And after that, uh, we recommend collecting data in we're using the command line interface to advisor, which is called which has this uh, complicated name advixi cl um, To collect all the information for root line, you need two collections, and and this is because uh, the first collection, which is uh, on the on the first line here, uh, dash collect survey. Is a, is a sampling based collection that is used for to get the timings for, for the uh, loops in the application and various other survey data like vectorizations. And then, and this is very fast, so it should run in roughly the same time it takes to run the application normally. Uh, the second part is the trip counts collection that actually collects the blobs and the bytes. And this, uh, is a is an instrument instrument uh, instruction counting collection, so it has a fairly high overhead. You can expect something like five times your regular runtime. Uh, but once these uh, two are collected, and and I want to point out here that that you need you have to specify the same project directory to advisors where it creates a database and then the trip counts collection just adds more data to it. Uh, you can you can launch the advisor GUI. So this this you can do on a on a login node. The the collection should be done on a compute node. And and again you just load advisor mm -hmm. and then launch the GUI with this advixi GUI command. So I'm going to so I run these collections for the stencil code that Sam was talking about, and, and I'm going to switch over to the GUI and, and in this first part of the demo, walk through the GUI quickly, show what's in there and how to access the roof line. So well, the first thing you see is uh, when you open the GUI is a welcome screen, and, and here you can you can open your result. I've already done that, so I'll just go to show my result. And, and that should take you to a summary screen that looks like this. So this gives you some general information on your application. Uh, things like you can see that the total number of, of flops has been counted. The, the total AI is here. You, 
you see that we run this uh, using 16 CPU threads. So this was run on a single socket Haswell node over, over a single socket of a two socket Haswell node. Um, you see metrics for vectorization efficiency, and then you see your top time-consuming loops highlighted. Um, where the, the real stuff is, is under this survey and roofline tab, and once you go there, it will break up uh, all this information by, by loops in your code. Um, so here in, in this in this example, we have five main loops that are using roughly the same amount of time. Um, you can see that the, here that you have the flops for each loop, uh, the AIs for each loop, and then if you move further, you see information on, on how well the loops have been vectorized, what are the vector lengths, what are the trip counts, what are the instructions that have been issued, data types and so on and and in the bottom part here it actually uh, links this information directly to, to your source code so I can I can click on one of these loops and it will point me to the line line in the code where this loop starts and, and give some even some information by source line such as time and, and what instructions have been issued uh, there are many multiple tabs here at the bottom that contain useful information. Uh, the top down gives a top down uh, structure of, of where the time is being spent in the code. So in this example, we have these uh, five loops called bench stencil version zero to four that are each using approximately one fifth of the time. Um, you, you have uh, this, this code analytics tab is, I find this very useful. So it gives you a summary on the, on the instruction mix that your application has used. So, so it, you, you can, we can see that about one third of our instructions are accessing memory. Then we have compute instructions, mixed instructions, which are basically uh, compute and read or write and, and then some something else that could not be categorized. So this gives you a nice uh, quick overview of, of what the code is actually doing. Um, you can view the assembly if that's your thing and, and this also highlights blocks of uh, like pins blocks of assembly code to the source code of your application. Um, so the, the point uh, point of this talk is, is the roof line. So there is a roof line tab here on the left and you can click on that and it gives it shows you the roof line and it shows uh, every loop of your application on the roof line chart separately and it uh, colors and, and sizes the, the points uh, with regard to the time that's spent spent in them. So in here, all of the loops spend about the same amount of time. Uh, so I want to uh, repeat that this is the cache aware roof line. So you see here that all of my, our loops have the arithmetic intensity of uh, 0.12, which is, I think Sam mentioned 0.11 was, was what they accept, expected. So so we're pretty close. Um, and, and here you can move over them with the mouse, you see the flops you're getting, the, the AI that's been measured, and, and, again, and, and still you can uh, navigate back to the source code to see what the, what the uh, individual loops are doing. Um, I should mention that the roofs here are, are, are based on measurements. So when you launch Advisor, it, it runs a small benchmark to measure these bandwidth and, and flop, flop loops of the, on, the, on the system you're running. And, and usually this, it, these numbers are pretty accurate. So Advisor does that for you? Advisor does that for you automatically. So you don't need to uh, give any, any commands for that. Um, there's an option. So this is a, is a threaded code. So we're running this on, on one half of the node. 
these these roofs obviously correspond to the whole node so so we should expect to reach about half of half of the peak performance uh, there's an option if your code is not ready to to go to roofs for a single threaded application uh, which can be useful and and I think they're working on increasing the flexibility here to to show you roofs for for running single socket for example that we would ultimately like here uh, okay so this was this was a quick uh, overview of the GUI um, um, so there are there are screenshots on the slides of the things I just went through um, are there any questions at this point? I think there was, uh, let's see, let's see if someone is going to ask a question about this. There is a pre uh, one that I think remained here. Is there a tool to calculate DRAM AI or L1, L2 AI for a complex application code? And not only small kernels. So, uh, in principle, advisor, you can run advisor on a complex application code. Um, the limitations are kind of that the runtime should not be uh, too long. So in the order of minutes is probably still okay. Um, and if you are, if you are, if you have a hybrid go code that uses MPI and OpenMP, it will analyze every MPI rank separately, and and that can create a lot of overhead. So we recommend just uh, collecting advisor data on a single rank and, and looking at that. Um, so so the question was about DRAM and L1, L2. So so at the moment, advisor only does L1. Uh, we are working with Intel to produce a version for DRAM, and it's pretty far along. So I will show you if I have time in the, in the final part and an example of this. Uh, stencil code with the DRAM advisor, and and I think L2 L2 is on our uh, shopping list, but uh, <laughs> I think we in, Intel has only so many resources to dedicate to this other time, so so they will work on it uh, in the future, I hope. Okay, so two related questions here: Is the roof line plot you showed for the whole application, for the whole application, or the loop, or, or just the loop you have highlighted? Um, so the so the roof so the whole application in this case only has these five loops that are plotted here on this roof line. Um, I think I've I've heard Intel mention a, a, a feature that allows you to sort of collapse all these loops into a single point on the roof line, but it's not in the release version yet. But that's also something that might be coming in future versions. Okay, so now, can we annotate a specific region of code to be profiled instead of a whole application, similar to v macros? Um, that's a good question. I don't remember exactly if, if Advisor supports the, the same start-stop uh, markers that v does. Uh, okay, I, I have to. Yes, yeah, so we are going to we are keeping these questions here and make sure that they are going to be answered in the Google Docs and we'll make the uh, the answers. We'll run the questions through the speakers again to see if the you know to make sure all there all the questions are uh, answered uh, um, um, uh, in detail. So the, 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 another question here uh, is: uh, Can this tool be used to Python or Cyton? Um well, I'm yeah, I'm not an expert. I think the answer is yes, but all the features <laughs> might not be there. So, sure. so, I, so they focus mostly on C and Fortran. I know that I think they have a version for Python, but I haven't used it, so I can't really say how complete it is. Just to add, the DRAM version requires uh, OpenMP. Uh, to, to highlight basic blocks. So we have more questions here. Is there still a piece of... Uh, so there is still a short piece of, okay, of yeah. about five minutes that I... Okay, so should so I go through that now? Yeah. Okay. So, so I want to 
talk about a little bit about this stencil code again. So we have prepared the, the five loops you saw in the previous example. So we've prepared five loops, five versions of the same uh, seven point stencil loop that, that highlight different optimizations that you might make in, in, uh, when, in your sort of optimization workflow. And, and we're gonna just go through them uh, quickly to show how that changes where the application sits on, on, on the two roofline models. So we use a 512 cube domain on a single Numa node, so a single Haskell socket, and this is basically just to eliminate any possible Numa effects that might show up. Um, and and the, the five versions, so in the first version, is a is a sort of a naive implementation where where you are striding or you are not telling the compiler how long your strides are in any of the three dimensions in memory and and to make sure that the compiler doesn't try to vectorize this it, it also has a no vector pragma in it so this is like a scalar uh, version of the of the loop then the first optimization is to enable vectorization by removing this pragma and also uh, specifying that the per inner, innermost loop of the stencil is unit strided, so, so that one can be vectorized. Uh, then the second optimization is to add some uh, cache blocking, so uh, to reduce uh, cache misses uh, by, by blocking the outer loop so that you can work on a on a set that fits in cache at the time, um, and then ad after that, additional optimizations are to improve vector vectorization by providing aligned pointers and strides, and then finally to force vectorization with the SIMD pragma and uh, use non-temporal stores to bypass uh, cache. And so, so I'm gonna uh, go back to this that I was showing previously. So the cache aware roof line. Um, you can see that that all these optimizations have the same AI because this is the uh, AI to L1. So no matter how you uh, change your memory access, the the AI will always always look the same, and you're just gaining performance by doing these optimizations. So, so you can see that the bottom point here is, is, the, is version zero. The top point here is, is version four, which you can see in the, in the name on the tooltip. And, and we go up to somewhere between uh, DRAM bandwidth and, and L3 bandwidth. So, so we, we get some cache use that takes us above DRAM, but not uh, ideal cache reuse that would, would push us up to up to L1 or L2. So now I'm going to switch over to the to the experimental uh, DRAM roofline version, and 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 look at the same code, and and now I have I have again five points on the roofline here, but now the AI is changing when we when we apply the optimizations. So in the first optimization from from version zero to one, which is just to enable vectorization, we we gain about a factor two in in flops. So we go from about 5.5 flops to 10. Uh, this is this is on a, on a Haswell with AVX2, and and like I said, we're using we're only using half of the node. We're only using one of the two sockets, so so we we can only expect to reach. Uh, half of the memory DRAM bandwidth of the node, which is pretty much what we've done here. And then by adding cache blocking, so you're now reducing the number of data you have to move from DRAM. So, so that increases your AI. And uh, the second version has, has gone up from an AI of, of about 0.17. So I should point out that, so even the has some cache reuse, so instead of 0.11, we have an AI of 0.17, but with the cache blocking, we get an AI of 0.28, and then going going up to the last optimization, we get to 0.41, which is close to the 
44 that Sam mentioned in his slides. Um, so, okay, so since time is running out, I think I will stop here and uh, wrap up and take some questions. Um, I just wanted to add, uh, back on the previous slide, uh, uh, just to invite people to, maybe, this is one, uh, invite, invite uh, people to come uh, to the uh, uh, SC17 roofline slash visor uh, tutorial on uh, Sunday, November 12th. Uh, it will be a, uh, a happy tutorial, and it is certainly a multi and many core focus. Uh, with that, Ashley?